Welcome everyone. Welcome back to our series for high voltage earthing system. Today we are going to discuss how to determine the earth grid resistance using soil resistivity and possible installed structures. During today's presentation, we are going to go quick introduction, standard history, power system in Australia and substation earthing system. The reason why I chose Australia because I spent uh, almost 17 years of my experience working across the Australian border. So the majority of this information will be built based on the previous experience. Before we start, what, what formed the substation earthing grid? You'll be very surprised that every single conductive structure, every single conductive structure is made solid part of the earth grid. The foundation of this post, the foundation of this post, all the con conductive structures must and shall be bonded together and at the end will be bonded to the earth grid. Why earth grid is an important from an electrical point of view? As we know, in every single transformer, we have either, let's put a pen, we have either, we have delta, delta, or we have delta y or we have y y or we have y delta these are the options that we have when it comes to our transformers if you ever study fault current for the ground fault current to exist you must close this path <clears throat> without closing the path under fault to ground, it's not possible for the ground current to be present. That's why it's very, very critical and important for us to ensure this pass has the lowest resistance possible to reduce the earth potential rise and reduce or eliminate the risk of high potential rise which could lead to human danger, which is jeopardize the safety of a human, and on top of that, could cause damage to the actual electric appliances. So if the fault current, the fault current, when you have a fault, it will go through the system, must go back to the star of the transformer that exit. If this path do not exist, there will be no ground current flowing through the system. In many places, especially within the mining system, you will notice that they will install stuff called NER, neutral earth resistor. This NER, they will use a value of this NER to reduce the fault current or to control I fault, to control it. So you can design a system where the fault current, the maximum fault current could be 5 amps, 10 amps. By introducing this resistor, the, by introducing stuff code, for example, NER, neutral earth resistor. If you have a system with low ground fault current, your protection must be updated to capture these faults. This will be explained in details during the section where there is a protection design lecture. What's an earth of potential rise? We spoke about earth of potential rise. The earth potential rise is basically 
the voltage equipped by the ground current. This is your ground current. This is your earth grid resistance. So basically, for the EPR, EPR determines the safety of your high voltage design infrastructure or the installed one. For me to make sure that my EPR is below the safety limit, to ensure safety is always maintained, I need to find the current injected into this earth grid under fault, and I need to also find the earth grid resistance of the high voltage substations. How can we do that? As we know, as we discussed before in the previous lectures and the beginning of this lecture, the grid resistance value has direct impact on the safety impediment of the design system. The soil structure that was engendered from the preceding chapters or lectures please refer to the previous lecture video, is one of the main elements in determining the precise grid resistance. So now we are going to go back to this soil resistivity. Which means the value of the earth grid resistance along with the fault current into the grid determine the earth's potential rise as we spoke before, as we discussed before. Now. The earth grid of an earthing system consists of the following. Pay attention. I could have an earth grid made of single electrode. I could have multiple electrode installed if a single electrode is not competent to accomplish the desired outcome. I could have a mesh grid. These guys, this one, usually could be done for a transmission pulse. This multiple electrode connected through a mesh I could use it for, for maybe bed mount substation. Bed mount substation. Maybe two electrodes with a mesh or a four electrode with a mesh. Also, this could be used as well for a Ugo pole. Ugo pole is underground to overhead pole, the transition. I can use a mesh grid. The mesh grid, I can use it. Mesh grid with an electrode as well, I can use it for a substation, power station, and other purposes. This is for basically for substation or for a power station and so on. So, I need to understand first my soil resistivity that we discussed in the previous chapter and then I need to check the final design the final proposal is it gonna be single electrode multiple electrode mesh combination of mesh and electrode and then one of the most important element is auxiliary path for everything which is we are going to uh, have a section in this lecture regarding the auxiliary earthing system this is an example, just to show you, and a single electrode. This is a mesh plate combination between uh, multiple electrode connected, or also you can have a mesh connected this all over together. This is an example of how do you put a mesh. The reason why we put a mesh underneath it, this mesh exists and as you can see it will be bonded to the switching structure so when you are standing on this mesh and you are touching these structures you will be on the same potential so the difference 
potential, the different in potential between your feet and your hand. Your hand will be here. Your feet will be standing on the soil in here. The difference voltage between these two points will be almost zero volt in concept. So there will be no, there will be no different in potential, which means you eliminate the risk of a touch voltage. Same within the substation, the mesh. Make sure that the step voltage between the two feet it's always almost neglected as well. Now, a substation, as we said before, everything must be bonded. Everything, all the infrastructure, the control rooms. Can you see this? Everything will be bonded. Your, your fence, everything will be bonded. This is will be solidly bonded. Every single structure where there is a switching or there's an access, they put a mesh to make sure that wherever there is a possibility of touching, you will have almost a zero volt. That's very important to achieve the V-touch, almost zero, or V-touch must be below V-allowable. Because every single system has an allowable touch voltage or allowable step voltage. And this also has been determined under IEEE 80 and 81 and also according to Australian standard. Now, this is a design step according to IEEE 80 design block. Let's go step by step. Let's take some time and explain this uh, diagram. Step number one, what does step number one involve? Number one, I need to determine my area. Step number two, step number one still, the second part of step number one. I need to go ahead and determine the soil restivity structure. I need to get the data, I need to get the fault current, I need to get the clearance time. Great. The fault current and clearance time, these are put under step number two. So step number one and step number two, what I've done is I spoke to the utility. Can you provide me please with your uh, fault current? 3I0. Clearance time. The area of the substations or the power station or the area I am designing the earth grid for. Soil restivity. If you've done the test, you can obtain the soil restivity. Great. After that, I go to step number three, where I go to the table of IEEE or IEC or Australian standard and obtain the step and the allowable step and touch voltage. After I determine all this information, I go to step number four, where I start my initial design. How do I start my initial design? For example, I start putting, this is, this is my area. For example, this is my area that I'm working on. This is my fenced area. I go and I check, hold on a second. I put a maybe a ring around it. With a couple of electrodes, depending on my system, then I put some mesh. I need to bond the fence to this. And then I run my simulation to see what type of, what type of step and touch I will acquire. This now it will give me an RG. It's equal. After I get the RG, I obtain IG for the grid current. And then I do the EPR. EPR. After I obtain my EPR, I check against the mesh and step voltages. If the system is complying, it's great. If it's not complying, I go back to the design to amend my grid. These steps are very easy to follow 
with practice. With a practice, you will see that it's very easy for you to follow these steps and it will become very, very uh, handy tools for any future design. So now, if you have a substation, usually formed of a mesh, and take, it, take into consideration, the mesh will take into consideration the location of the building and the bonding to it. What's an earth grid resistance? Guys, if you have a fault, if you have, this is a transmission line, you have a fault, the current will flow like this, goes back, goes back to the start. As you can see, if I have an auxiliary pass, what's an auxiliary pass? Auxiliary pass, it's a pass for the fault current and at the substation that can take without going into the ground. This path is take the ground as a pass. This pass, it's an auxiliary pass, could be presented by an overhead earth wire, by a cable screen, earth continuity cable, and so on. Using IEEE standard, there is multiple equations to determine your earth grid resistance depending on how accurate you want to get. Very simple way you will find the resistivity and then you will find the area of your earth grid and you can use this equation. This will give you an estimation, estimated value. Remember this using single layer or as we spoke before how to estimate a, a uniform soil layers depending on the positive and negative reflection of your uh, two soil layers. Please refer back to our previous lecture that discussed soil resistivity. For further analysis, further analysis, IEEE then said, hold on a second, we can use this. This is give us a more accurate uh, readings. What did IEEE now standard said? Said, hold on, we want to take into consideration this, the total buried length conductor in meters. And this can give us a higher accuracy so resistance grid resistance than the previous one then said hold on a second this will be installed at a depth of h so they went and they upgraded the equations to take into consideration the length the area this is the uh, length the area and the depth of the installed earth grid. This equation will give us better result than the previous two. Then there is a Schwarz equation for the grid resistance. Then Schwarz said, hold on a second. I have a ground resistance for the mesh which is represented by R1. I have a ground resistance represented by an electrode represented by R2. I have a mutual ground impedance between these two. So I can use RG with this equation. R1 is used by this equations and these are the variables k1 and k2 are the coefficient as seen by IEEE 80 
and this is R2 and also these are the variable and this is Rm which is this is represent your coefficients K1 and K2 and these are the condition for the curve A B and C and this is the condition for A B and C remember this will give you if you want you can create an excel file the excel file you can embed all this information and if you embed all this information it will be very easy for you to have a quick estimated value of your grid resistance if you are doing an audit on a earthing report or anything else now one of the most important element guys we spoke that the APR it's equal to RG RG we showed you the RG the most important element for IG is using this equation this will give you the highest accuracy is this one now if I go back I want to understand that a this earth grid current is governed by the split factor by the split factor what's a split factor when you have a fault current the fault current is split into the substation and to the earth system look let's look at it from a different point of view i have a current goes into here i have in here this is R G and I have this is called R auxiliary based on the current divider rule this current IF will be divided into this current and this current this is known as IG this current known as I auxiliary which is also known could be you can see it as IE for uh, overhead earth wire or could you see it as I return now how does the system will work guys it's just it's a normal circuit analysis normal circuit analysis I have this current comes into heat this current comes into heat this current and this current the IF based on the nodal analysis will be equal to IG plus IE IE is presented by this one and IG by this one this is my node that I'm analyzing on against this is my node now I know this value I can find this value I know this value I know this value which you will see all I have to do now is I apply current divider rule with a mutual coupling and then I can introduce Delta F which is known as a split factor after I find IG, I put it into the equation and I find the substation Earth potential-wise. Okay. What's a split factor? I need to first determine the substation Earth grid, which is I've already done based on what I did before. I need now to determine the phase and overhead Earth wire arrangement if you have an overhead type of overhead Earth wire overhead earth wire input impedance so because there is there will be there will be a mutual inductance between this and this I need to determine that's the separation or between this and that or between this and this if there's a fault on this side or fault on this side depending where my fault location is 
this is my overhead earth wire this is my overhead earth wire I need to determine because the mutual related to distance the worst case scenario is presented by the farthest fault so if a fault happen on this on this phase that would represent the worst case scenario because ZM will be very weak because the distance is the biggest so the separation for example this is your overhead earth wire and this is your phase for example let's phase A the distance of these two separation impact on ZM and the worst case scenario for your case you have to assess the system for a fault happen the biggest distance between these two which is presented on the lowest on the lowest phase two type of overhead earth wire has to be taken into consideration one of them this is as you can see it will stop at a certain distance this will be continued from one end to another end that's why known as a continuous of none over of or or non continuous overhead earth wire which is this will determine to us two elements finite and infinite conditions the AC characteristic of the overhead earth wire will provide this is the Z of an overhead earth wire it's called self impedance this is your frequency this RS is the resistance provided by the manufacturer of your cables of your conductors if you're using for example mango Pluto olives any type of conductors you will go to the specification and you find RS geometric mean radius NDE we will define it the self impedance for a different type conductors under the soil resistivity because DE is related to the soil resistivity it has a relation to soil resistivity these are I ran a quick system and you will see that for Leo the self impedance this is ohm per kilometers guys you can see this is almost 1.2 for let's say for example for Uranus it's just under 0 0.6 for Venus same if I go for example I look at this one it's almost 1 and so on so you can determine the actual self impedance of an overhead earth wire by applying these equations what's a finite and infinite condition it's very important to capture the definition under a finite system the source substation grid resistance is taken into consideration during the calculation of the input impedance under infinite system the source substation grid resistance is not taken into consideration during calculation of the input impedance finite system that mean you can see both end that mean the two substation are very close to each other under infinite system conditions your substations under fault for example let's say I have substation A and I have substation B if the distance like this all this overhead earth wire if the system is infinite whatever I see from this point doesn't capture this B if it's finite I have to take the entire system what will determine the finite and infinite system if you have the length L of your overhead earth wire meet this equation the system will be infinite if it doesn't meet this equation the system will be finite so 
it's very important to determine that this is Z S, this is Z P. L S is the average span length. For example, I have all this pole. This is my overhead earth wire, for example. This is the length of the span. The L S is the average length of the span. The span, the span of overhead earth wire between two poles. When I come to an infinite conditions, I can use this hypothesis and I can say, hold on a second. After a certain distance, I only can see Z infinite, which is going to be always Z infinite. Irrespective of how much you add to it, it's going to be always remain Z infinite. If I go ahead and I determine this, I end up with an equation. If I determine Z infinite, it's equal to ZP parallel. So based on this circuit, I can say, hold on a second, Z infinite, it's equal to ZS plus ZP parallel with Z infinite. This ZS is your impedance of the between the substation. This is between ZG or RG and your first pole. This is Z pole 1, if you want to call it, and this is your ZS. It's basically the connection span, span between your last pole, transmission pole, and your substation earth grid. As a research conducted uh, at the Western Sydney University, this is this can be presented. for a finite conditions. This, all this grid before the last one is can be presented by this equation. This is under finite conditions. And this is under finite non-continuous conditions. So if I have the earth wire is only extended to multiple pole, I can use this equation to determine my input impedance for this. And as we saw, I have a fault current coming in. This is my RG. <coughs> and there will be a split under my condition. Z input. Which is, this is my Z input. Plus, I have to take into consideration ZM. <coughs> So, if I apply mesh analysis into this loop, what do, what do I gain? What's mesh analysis into this loop will give me? Will give me, if you pay attention, this is my current, I have IE, Z infinite, minus IG, RG, See, goes backward, and here, see this, minus IF ZM, it's equal to zero. I do the calculation, I do the calculation, and then ZM is defined by this value, I will end up with a split factor. Split factor depend, as you can see, on this input impedance, a grid, grid substation, grid resistance, and the input impedance of the overhead earth wire. So, finite non-continuous overhead earth wire. The coupling factor, this was done, by the way, this is not ca captured by any standard. This is captured by the research that was conducted by us at the Western Sydney University. Uh, between the period of 2012 and 2015. This is what's being found, that the coupling factor under the finite condition of a non-continuous overhead earth wire has the same fraction of the full coupling factor as is the actual length of the infinite length. What does this mean? This is a coupling factor 
for a full infinite line. This is the actual one. This is what was being defined by the research if you have a non-continuous finite overhead earthwire. And this would be now the new split factor. So you no longer can use this in here. If you have a finite non-continuous overhead as well. It's very critical for you to use the appropriate or the actual coupling component into your system. And you can find it into this publication which was published in 2014. This will reflect the effective length. So as soon I reach my effective length, which is the overhead earth wire, this is now will become a 100% effect of the coupling factor, which is defined by ZGW divided by Z, ZS. Based on the split factor, it is very possible now to compute your IG, it's equal to, this is a split factor, IF. IF is determined by the utility. Split factor, you, it was calculated based on your uh, auxiliary pass. After you find IG, then E, P, R, it's equal to IG, RG, which is equal to this split factor multiplied by IF multiplied by RG. I hope that's very clear, and I really hope you all have a brief understanding about the earth grid resistance and how we obtain these values. Thank you for listening and we will see you during our next um, presentations.